Welcome to God's Playbook with your host, Father Rico Passero. It's a 20, 10, 5, touchdown! Touchdown! Let's play ball. Friends, welcome back to God's Playbook. We end our third part series on this, the Roman Canon or Eucharistic Prayer 1. The priest then continues, Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the blessed passion, the resurrection from the dead and the glorious ascension into heaven of Christ your Son and our Lord, we, your servants and your holy people, offer to your glorious majesty from the gifts that you have given us this pure victim, this holy victim, this spotless victim, the holy bread of eternal life and the chalice of everlasting salvation. There's a lot here to unpack. So first and foremost, therefore, O Lord, as the priest continues on his own, as we celebrate the memorial of the blessed passion, the resurrection of the dead, this shows, friends, that we don't separate the two, that the crucifixion leads to the resurrection. And then we also speak of the ascension. That's where Jesus went up to heaven as his disciples saw him go up. Of Christ your Son and our Lord. It shows this unity between God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We, your servants and your holy people, offer to your glorious majesty. See, we continue to worship God. That's what Mass is, worshiping God. From the gifts you have given us, showing our dependency on the generosity of God, This pure victim, this holy victim, this spotless victim. Jesus is the victim. He was innocent and slain for our sins. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The holy bread of eternal life and the chalice of everlasting salvation. This isn't a holy meal. We are salivating on the body and blood of Jesus. So it's not like when we just... Ask God to bless us, O Lord, in these thy gifts which you are about to receive from your bounty through Christ our Lord. Amen. And now, oh, well, our dinner is holy. No, we've asked God to bless our food, but this isn't blessed food. This is Jesus, the Eucharist. He is the bread of life. He is the cup of our salvation. This is much bigger, much more important. Be pleased to look upon these offerings with the serene and kindly countenance, the priest continues, and to accept them as once you are pleased to accept the gifts of your servant, Abel the just, the sacrifice of Abraham our father in faith, and the offering of your high priest Melchizedek, a holy sacrifice, a spotless victim. What's so beautiful and important here is we ask God to be pleased to look upon the offerings with his serene and kindly countenance. This idea that may these gifts be pleasing to you, O God. We are doing it because God is asking us to do it. And when a child does what his or her parents ask him or her to do, it does bring the parents joy, doesn't it? And so when we do what God has asked us to do, we too should recognize that we are placing a smile on the face of our Creator. Now think of this beautiful unity as well. And to accept them as you accepted gifts of other people. So we think of Abel, the just. This comes to us from the book of Genesis. Cain and Abel, does that story ring a bell to you? Then we have the sacrifice of Abraham, our father in faith. Remember, he was willing to give up his son and God stopped him. Only the Father will give up his son, Jesus himself, to be our lamb. And the offering of your high priest Melchizedek continues to show that Melchizedek, the holy priest, offered sacrifice to God that was pleasing to him. So we are asking God to accept our gifts just as he accepted their gifts. A holy sacrifice a spotless victim. So it's not an unblemished lamb. It's not some turtle dove. It's not some other form of God's creation. It is God himself who gives himself to us for our salvation. 
Now, at this point, again, the priest's hands have been raised, palms to heaven, signifying the lifting up to God of the people's prayer on behalf of the people. Again, even if you're reading this in the Missal, you should not be saying these words. These are reserved for the priest alone. You might see a deacon at your church. He does not use these words either. Only the priest is to say those words. So don't fall into the trap of reading along and saying those words yourself. This next part of the Eucharistic prayer is where the priest's posture changes. You will see that he bows deeply from his waist and looks down, signifying that he is unworthy as well as the people are unworthy to stand in the presence of God for the sacrifice. So he says, in humble prayer, we ask you, almighty God, command that these gifts be borne by the hands of your holy angel to your altar on high in the sight of your divine majesty, so that all of us who through this participation at the altar receive the most holy body and blood of your Son may be filled with every grace and heavenly blessing. Friends, this is significant. So his hands are folded and he's bowed down, showing humility on behalf of himself and the people. In humble prayer, see the word humble is used there, we ask you, almighty God, So we're asking that the angel take the gifts from the altar here on earth and present them to Almighty God. We don't see a movement of the gifts themselves. But just because we don't see things doesn't mean that they aren't happening. And so it's this idea of that the angels who are God's messengers often accepted the sacrifices made by the people. So we ask that the angels take them and offer them to God for us, to your altar on high in the sight of your divine majesty. This signifies that God is so much greater than each of us. So that all of us through this participation at the altar, as we pray together as community, may receive the most holy body and blood of your Son and be filled with every grace and heavenly blessing. So the priest makes the sign of the cross on his body, and you are encouraged to do the same. This signifies that we rely on the blessing and the grace of God to sustain us in all that we do. What's important here is you see him make the sign of the cross, and he moves from that profound bow to once again having his arms extended with palms raised to heaven. He continues now praying for those who are dead. Remember, we had the commemoration of the living, as we learned two days ago, and now we have the commemoration of the dead. The word used here is remember, which again means bless, not that God forgets anything. Remember also, Lord, your servants who have gone before us, mark with the sign of faith, and rest in the sleep of peace. Here is where the priest may audibly include names for which the Mass is offered in a particular way, which we call the Mass intention. We pray for everyone at every single Mass, but there might be a special intention where we pray for one person in particular or two people in particular, but these are for the deceased people, where earlier we were praying for those who are living, ourselves and those we know. Here is where we pray for those who are deceased. So don't pray for your loved ones in the wrong part of the prayer because this is about those who have died. So as the priest pauses there, I encourage you to lift your loved ones in prayer, whether they died last week or 100 years ago. Okay, Make sure that they are being prayed for. If they're already in heaven and they don't need our help anymore, fantastic. Then God will use the grace upon ourselves. But if they're not there yet and they've been in purgatory a long time, and need our prayers to help them to cut down on that time so they can go to heaven. Wouldn't we want to help them? So let's make sure that we do. After the priest pauses, then he says these words, Grant them, O Lord, we pray, and all who sleep in Christ, a place of refreshment, light, and peace. By the language itself, it suggests just that that the priest is showing compassion and the desire to pray for all who have died 
and that we ask God to help them by giving them a place of refreshment, light, and peace. So we say when we hear of somebody who has died, may they rest in peace. What we're actually asking is that they rest in peace in the arms of God. That's what that really means. Some people just say, oh, may they rest in peace. No, we don't want them to just be eternally asleep in death. We want them to be forever alive in life. As the soul is in heaven, that's the goal, and then eventually the body will meet the soul there at the end of time. So again, it's important, friends, that we make sure that we're praying for our loved ones too, okay? The final part of the Eucharistic prayer here, the priest continues, To us, your servants, who though sinners, hope in your abundant mercies. Graciously grant some share in fellowship with your holy apostles and martyrs. So here is another list of saints, another part of what's called the litany of saints, different from the first. Here we have some of the early saints of the church, and also you'll notice many of them are women. So some men are listed and some women are listed too. And these are people that again had a significant impact on the spreading of faith in the early church. So with John the Baptist, Stephen, Matthias, Barnabas, Ignatius, Alexander, Marcellinus, Peter, Felicity, Perpetua, Agatha, Lucy, Agnes, Cecilia, Anastasia. These are just some examples of some powerful men and women who were influential in the spreading of faith. And so we rely on their prayers to help to sustain us in all that we do. What I like to do is I like to add a few more saints to the end of that list. First and foremost, the saint who happens to be the patron of our diocese here locally, St. Catherine of Alexandria. In your own parish, the priest may use the saint, that is the patron saint of the parish, unless they're already named in the litany of the saints. The priest may also use other contemporary saints that may identify with the particular mass, his own spirituality, or with the people. I know I always used Catherine of Alexandria, John Paul II, and Teresa of Calcutta. However, this is optional, not mandatory. Following that, he says, And all your saints, admit us, we beseech you, into their company, not weighing our merits, but granting us your pardon through Christ our Lord. So it's showing that we rely on the prayers of the saints and everyone in heaven, the ones that we are aware of and the ones that are there that we are not yet aware of. Okay? So we recognize and and rely on the truth that there are many, many, many people in heaven interceding for us. The reality is I then have to receive that grace and be able to apply it to live a life that is holy. But this idea of let us admit and beseech us into their company, that one day we want to be with them. Why? Because I want to be with Padre Pio? Because I want to be with St. Peter? Well, that might be a bonus, but the real reason is because I want to be with God, and they're with God. So, of course, I want to be in their company, but I most importantly want to be in the company of God. He's the true VIP. Not weighing our merits, but granting us your pardon. This, again, reminds us that it is the pardon and mercy of God that allows for life eternal. Then he continues to say, Through whom you continue to make all these good things, O Lord, you sanctify them and fill them with life. You bless them and bestow them upon us. This again shows that every good thing comes from God. God sanctifies and makes them holy. He fills us with life, blesses them, and makes them given to us. So everything we have comes from him. Total dependency. We might think that it is I who have done this, But no, it is always God who has done this, okay? At this point, friends, we come to the end of the Eucharistic prayer, which we call the doxology, in which the priest raises the paten with the host on it, raises the chalice, 
with the precious blood of Jesus inside and says, Through him and with him and in him, O God Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. And our response is, Amen. Now at Mass, this is to be sung on a Sunday, this part especially. However, if the priest says it, then you just recite it. If the priest sings his part, then you are encouraged to sing it as well. And this whole promise of praise for God helps us to identify that indeed he is eternal, the God who is, who was, and is to come. And it also brings some closure to our part of what we are asking God for in the Eucharistic prayer. The transformation of the bread and wine into the body and blood of Jesus. And we also ask God to listen to our needs and our prayers. Following this, friends, which of course that part is only to be said by the priest, then we are encouraged to stand as we continue on with Mass. This ends the first part of the study of Eucharistic Prayer 1, or the Roman Canon. This helps us to identify again, what are we seeing? What are we saying? And are we saying from the bottom of our heart? May the Eucharistic prayer, especially Eucharistic prayer one, help us to come to know God more intimately and to praise him for all that he does for us. For God's Playbook friends, I'm Father Rico. God loves you and so do I. If you like what you hear, please consider supporting us using any of our affiliate links in the description below via Budsprout, Ko-Fi, or GoFundMe. Thanks, and God bless.